recording because we post these up to our Genesee Valley uh, YouTube channel. So if anybody uh, is overly concerned about privacy, and I don't blame you, put on your mask now. Um, but what we're going to do is let me start screen sharing. So here is Rob. <clears throat> There we go. Okay, so Rob's today. Now, um, I joined the BMW Club in 1992 when a friend convinced me that I should buy a used E28 instead of some kind of a Honda. And I started to read, and he was right. Uh, and, and I started reading the roundel and really enjoyed the hack mechanic. And now, here, years later, we get rid of this. We have Rob with us. Uh, I've still got my 2002. So actually, the, the the good news for me was several years later, I was able to con my wife into buying a 2002 as our second car. All right. And, uh, you know, she thought they were cute. <laughs> and we still have it. Uh, now, um, over the years, Rob's written many columns, um, a lot of excellent books of which if I look back here, we might just happen to find a few of them. Uh, and I, I recommend them all highly to you. And Rob is going to, uh, I guess, regale us with stories. <laughs> I always think of Rob as doing the most with the least. I just, I don't know how you do it, but he's able to, I think the changing the head with Paul Wegweiser and Ben and at the vintage must rank way up there. <laughs> Well, to be clear, it. I was just handing them the tools and the That's towels. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, but but he always has these great. I think I think he is the inspiration for all of us who are working in our garages and don't have access to, you know, CAD controlled mills, lathes, and unlimited budgets. Let me before I turn it over to Rob. Let me just uh, remind you that if talking about cars is good, but you might want to play with your cars and you're in our neck of the wood, woods, we're gonna be running uh, driving events at the New York Safety Track, which is a really kind of funky, sort of rustic track on top of a mountain in sort of middle New York, that in May. And then we're going back to Watkins Glen, the infamous or bucket list track in June, August and October. So with that, let me stop screen sharing and turn it over to our speaker. Okay, so you folks can see me and not the PowerPoint presentation, correct? Okay, just making sure. So hi folks, um, uh, I'm Rob. I am your hack mechanic, um, living life on the edge so you don't have to. As I like to say. Um, Huh? Okay. Um, someone had asked me if I would start with a tour of the garage. We are in the garage, so you can you can see the Lotus right there. That's my '74 Lotus Europa twin cam. You can see Hampton, which is the forty-eight thousand mile '73 um, two thousand two that I've been writing about. Uh, my Z three is right there. Uh, all the crap is against the wall. That's the part that you shouldn't see. And uh, that's probably enough of a tour for now. <laughs> um, so I have a presentation uh, that I will chat through. And um, then I'm happy to answer anything that you want. So let me make sure I'm able to toss this up. Hold on. OK, so can you see the presentation? Okay, excellent. So, um, come on, click. There we go. So I think you all know who I am. So I've been, I've been writing for Roundel for now 35 years. This year is my 35th anniversary. Um, I also write for Haggerty Magazine. Uh, I write for both Roundel and Haggerty online every week, as well as for the magazines. I just started to write for, um, 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 Forbes Wheels Online. I spent one year writing at Road and Track, which was exciting. And I have out a bunch of books. 
Uh, who am I really? Uh, I have a long history of being mistaken at airports for Mr. For Mr. Clapton, uh, for, for Barry Gibb, uh, and after the trio of recent Star Wars movies for Mark Hamill. Uh, but I am, I am in fact, your hack mechanic. Um, so how to be a hack mechanic, if you want to be like me, and maybe you don't, and I don't really encourage it because it's, it's exhausting, frankly. Um, you know, as, uh, as Ian said, uh, what I do and what I write about originated, you know, 30 some odd years ago about just wanting to fix my cars without having to take them to the dealer whenever they hiccuped. There wasn't an internet, there wasn't a World Wide Web, there wasn't online users mm -hmm. forums. Uh, I thought I was unique in this. And it was through the BMW Car Club that I found out that I'm not unique at all. A lot of folks like to do what it is that I do. So um, I noticed cars from a very young age. Uh, you know, once I had a little money, I started to buy cars that I craved that had a lot of miles on them and that needed work. And that way I was able to afford them. I would hold on to the interesting ones. At some point I had this epiphany that I wasn't working on the cars exclusively uh, in order to afford them that I actually enjoyed it. It was very satisfying. It was like a form uh, of therapy working on the cars. Um, remember that life is short and cars are cool and friends don't let friends drive Subarus. I've been asked what I have against Subarus. I have nothing against Subarus. It's just a convenient whipping boy. And most important, don't cheat on your spouse and you may be able to get away with this. Um, not all of us are car, are, are car guys, um, but a lot of us are. Um, there's a, a personality type that seems to go along with this that can extend into spending too much money and ignoring your family. Don't be that guy. Don't do that. Really bad idea. So how did a nice Jewish kid from Long Island like me become a car nut? Can, when, can you get um, I, don't, I don't know how to do that. When, when my parents had a 63 uh, Ford Fairlane. The, like the column called the Hack Mechanic. Satellite, um, a 74 Fiat 128, and a Chevette. Yes, my mother actually owned a Chevette. And the answer <laughs> just seems to be that I was wired that way. As I said, I'm from Old Bethpage, Long Island. There were Corvettes on Long Island. I remember when I was five years old, a guy down the street um, had bought a 63 split windowed Corvette. And as a five-year-old, I remember going, ah, and thinking that this was the most beautiful thing that I'd ever seen. Imagine be when I became an adult and a car nut and found out I was right, <laughs> that it was one of the most beautiful things that I'd ever seen. Um, the, the BMW thing, the 2002 thing happened because I lived in Amherst, Massachusetts. My mother used to work at Hampshire College. Um, there was a seemingly endless stream of Hampshire students um, who were traipsing through our house and sleeping there overnight or for a week or for a month or for a summer. And one of them was a Hampshire student who had a red 71 2002 with the license plate that said, Geist, which is German for spirit. And he used to drive me around the back roads of Amherst in that car, scaring the crap out of me and forever impressing upon me what that little German two-door sedan could do. So when I graduated high school and my mother offered to buy me a car, what did I buy? Did I buy a 2002? No, I bought this piece of crap. I bought, I bought a 1970 Triumph GT6 Plus, the car that proved that everything bad you've ever heard about British cars is true. The electrical problems, the metal fatigue problems, all of it. But it was very cute and uh, it was actually pretty quick. Um, in between the cars, uh, I was in a band. The band had this half-sized international um, travel all, I think it was called, which was which was a school bus. It was a little half size school bus, a four speed with a two speed axle. And I had to work on that in order to keep it running for the band. Uh, 
my wife, Mary Ann, who was not yet my wife, had bought a Volkswagen bus. Uh, we moved down to Austin. We, we drove down to Austin in, uh, in that bus. Uh, it rotted out from its life living in New England. So I found a camper um, with a bad engine. Um, I yanked out the good engine. I gave it a light rebuild uh, on the floor of the kitchen in our apartment at 101 West 35th in Austin um, and threw it into the camper and we owned that for a while. Um, finally in Austin in 1982, I bought my first 2002. It didn't look like this. Uh, I say that it was equal parts rust and Bondo and, and Colorado paint. Um, and it uh, needed the transmission rebuilt. So my first repair on a BMW was literally rebuilding <laughs> the transmission, something I never have attempted since. Um, and uh, I, I had it painted um, when having a car repainted was inexpensive. Uh, and then since this was Austin and since the first 2002 did not have air conditioning, I found one that did, which made Marianne very happy. And so that started off this pattern which has persisted for nearly 40 years of you know, having a car and working on it. And when I find something else or something nicer, I buy it and I, I sell the other one. Um, then there were the coupes. Uh, I, I, I returned to Boston. I went through a whole slew of other 2002s, but really what I wanted was an E9 coupe. And I found this one, um, which had been hit in the nose. This was actually after it was partially repaired. I didn't know um, how badly they rot um, then. I didn't know that then. Uh, this car had been hit in the nose. It needed a nose and fenders and a hood. Uh, and those parts were expensive, but not hellishly expensive then. I think they all cost me $1,200 collectively. Um, so I, I, I bought them. I had them installed. That was all the money I had in the world. So I drove the car um, half in paint and half in primer for two years. I saved my money. I took out a bank loan. I then had it stripped and then I had it repainted. Uh, that's actually a Mercedes shade of signal red. So yes, I, uh, I performed uh, the unforgivable sin of not only repainting a car in non-original color, um, but a color outside of the palette of the manufacturer. I don't care. I love my red E9. It is drop dead gorgeous to this day. This was actually shot uh, almost 10 years ago on the Blue Ridge Parkway, but this is still how the car looks. For a while, I had three of them at once. Uh, there's the red one in the front. Uh, I had a 75 E9 that had come through Saudi Arabia. Um, and then I had another one that I had bought as a parts car, but it ran. So I was actually planning on using it as a winter beater, or as we say in Boston, a winter beater. Um, and I was all set to do that. I hadn't yet registered it. I was kind of swapping the plates more times than I should have. And the city of Boston hauled it off and crushed it, <laughs> which was a real shame. It was a parts car, but it was still a running E9. Um, so since 1982, according to my count, there have been about 70 BMWs of which about half have been 2002s. So that's about, to a year. Is that a little? Is that a lot? I don't know. To me, it seems about right. Um, if I'm known for something when I die, it may be this, which is that every car guy needs three cars. So there's the daily driver, there's the family hauler, there's the pampered classic. Ah, but then there's also the convertible or roadster. There's something for the track. There's something to tow with or to take out on the beach to fish. And then there's whatever the current project car happens to be. So like I said, every car guy needs seven cars. So this has become known as Siegel's seven car rule. I've had folks ask me, where's the parts car? Well, I live here in suburban Boston. Uh, my neighbors would crucify me 
if I tried to have a parts car on my property. So I encourage you to have your own rule. If it's eight for you, it's eight for you. Um, so just to enumerate what these are, my daily driver is a 2003 E39 530i five-speed sport. This is the best BMW I've ever owned. I never expected it to be. I kind of prefer my cars lighter uh, and a little snappier. But I bought this because um, it was cheap. Uh, it was a $1,500 car with about 180,000 miles on it and, um, and in need of a battery and not really a lot else. And man, I just love this thing. Uh, I've had other E39s that have eaten me alive. And this one has not. Maybe it's because it's at the end of the run, right? It's a last year car. But it is just wonderful. It's exactly the right amount of power. It handles great. It's, it's really comfortable. Uh, I, I love the stereo. I kind of refer to this as my old man car because I use those sort of adjectives. Well, it's comfortable. It's got a great stereo, but it's been wonderful. Uh, the family hauler right now, uh, I have three children, but they're all adults. So the minivans are long since gone. So this is Mary Ann's 2013 Honda Fit Sport. She prefers driving a five speed. God love her. Um, and this has also been an absolutely wonderful little car. Uh, the Pampered Classic is the 3.0 CSI. This was just shot last year. So this is still what it looks like. Um, by the way, when it was repainted, it was repainted um, uh, in a base coat, clear coat configuration. There's a lot of debate about painting vintage cars that were originally painted in a straight color about repainting them only in a straight color. Um, and folks who know a lot more about this than I do will say that it's really only a straight color that is able to give you the depth of the finish that makes it look like you want to fall into it. Whereas um, a paint job that's a base coat and a clear coat is more about the shine, it's more of a trick as opposed to the depth of the finish. Well, I'm here to tell you that 32 year, 33 years after this was painted, when the sun hits it, it looks like someone switched on the paint. It, 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 just, it just lights up in the sun. So I have, I have no regrets about having had it shot um, in a base coat, clear coat configuration. Uh, the convertible Roadster, I have a very vanilla 99 Z3 2.3. Uh, which is actually a 2.5. I sold it a couple of years ago and I recently uh, decided to buy it back. I love this thing. I love, I love Z3s. They're small, they're light, they're inexpensive, they're snappy, just absolutely wonderful cars. I do have a 99 Z3 M Coupe that I've owned for a while now. Um, I don't do high performance driving events, so I don't track the car. Um, I love the car. Um, uh, a, um, it's, it's as quick as I need a car to be. So it's a 99. So this is an S52 car. It's not an S54 car, but like I said, it's as, it's as fast as I need a car to be. Um, the tow monster for years was a whole fleet of Suburbans. I think I had six or, or seven of them, which I used uh, to take the family on vacation. Uh, and to tow cars. Right now, I do not have a truck. Instead, we have this small RV. I have a 96 Winnebago Rialto, which is actually a Volkswagen Eurovan with a Winnebago camper body on the back. Uh, we don't use it for long road trips. We use it mostly to go to the beach, um, you know, for a few overnights. I, I have to tell you, <laughs> of all of the crazy vehicles that I have bought this one, the one with the bathroom in it is among the smartest purchases that I have ever made. Um, even ignoring things like overnights, just simply to throw the bikes on the back and to ride on a bike trail for several hours, um, simply being able to return to a vehicle with a restroom in it is just absolutely life-changing. Um, and then whatever the current project car happens to be, um, I'm not a collector. Uh, I think I have a slide about that later. Um, I'm more kind of a crime of opportunity guy. 
Uh, I like to see cars with my own eyes. I don't really trust remote buying. Um, so when things show up, you know, um, within a 150, 200 mile-ish radius, if they sound promising, I will drop everything and go and see them. So this Bavaria showed up on Craigslist about six or seven years ago. I spoke to the seller and, you know, I said, well, how much rust does it have? And he said, well, it, it's a rust-free car. And I, I said, come on, there's, <laughs> there's no such thing as a rust-free Bavaria. And he said, no, really, this, this was a California car. It was owned by a guy who had brought it east. He used to show us. It passed away. It went into storage. Um, I bought it as part of, as part of the settlement of the estate. Um, I have it in a warehouse. I have a lift. You can, you know, uh, if you come and look at it, you can have a look under it on the lift. So I drove up to Kittery, Maine. Um, sure enough, uh, there was the car in a warehouse on a lift. The guy handed me a drop light. I walked under it and there was not a rust hole anywhere on this car and very little rust of any kind. And so I, you know, uh, I think the guy was asking five grand for it. And, um, you know, I kind of hemmed and hawed. I said, well, you know, I, I think, you know, I think I'm about to lose my job and I'm out of storage. And he said, well, he said, in fact, I know who you are. I've been reading your stuff for years. I'd love the car to go to you, um, tell you what, four grand and a um, hundred dollars to hold it over the winter and you can store it here over the winter. How are you not supposed to do something like that, right? If you say no to that, the automotive powers that be are never going to dangle a car in front of you ever again. So I bought it and I love this thing. Um, then not long after I happened into this Euro um, 79 635 CSI, I had gone to Shark Fest about a year before and I found out that the look of the Euro six series cars with the Euro bumpers, particularly the early ones, the ones that are based on the E12 series instead of the E28 five series, they have this look all their own largely because of, of the shorter bumpers. And I thought if I, if I find one of those for a reasonable price, I would, I would love to buy it. So I found this one in Connecticut. The guy had added on uh, these expensive refinished wheels, an Alpina steering wheel, um, um, some other things. And yet the gas tank was leaking and the wipers didn't work. It was a very odd set of choices to make. So no one was interested in the car and he was asking way too much money. Uh, I looked at it, I loved the car, but he wouldn't budge. So, you know, we parted as friends and three months later he contacted me. He had bought something else and he wanted to get rid of the car. And I wound up negotiating, um, you know, I, did, I didn't wanna pay what he thought the wheels were worth. So I wound up literally going down there with a tow truck and a set of wheels and splitting off the wheels, buying the car for a price that I could afford. Um, this car does not have its original M90 motor. It does not have the dog leg five speed. Uh, those two things greatly affect its value. Um, it, uh, it did not have air conditioning. Uh, it has 215,000 miles on it and it clearly has been hit in the front. You can, you can see that from the look of the inner fenders, but the price was right. And so much of what I do, as I said, I'm not a collector. A collector wouldn't make this choice, right? I like to be the person who is driving the cars that he is passionate about on a Sunday morning and smiling instead of the person craving what he can't afford because he wants something that's perfect. Um, you'll notice I'm now on to several whatever the current project car happens to be. So I bought the Lotus in a weak moment. This was one of the only cars I've ever bought sight unseen. Um, my friend Ben had a look at it for me in Chicago and Ben has a Lotus Elan. Um, it had been in a container uh, since um, 1979. The engine had seized from sitting, but it was very original. So I bought it. It sat here for um, 
about five and a half years <laughs> while I tried to rebuild the engine cost effectively. I had no clue what was involved in rebuilding this somewhat exotic Lotus Ford twin cam engine. In the vintage BMW world, you know, if you have a 2002 and you want a motor for it, what do you want to pay? If you want to pay 500 bucks, you can find some $500 motor that someone says, well, you know, um, I don't know what the provenance of this motor is, but it's not frozen. You know, if you want to pay 1200, you can find a motor where someone says, I yanked this out of a car myself. I saw it run. It wasn't visibly burning oil. If you want to pay 2500, you can find one that has some sort of provenance in terms of a recent rebuild. There are no motors like that for this car. So in the meantime, I lost my job. You know, I switched careers. And so stretching out the work was the only way that I could afford it. Um, I now love this thing. It's a, it's a crazy, very un-BMW-like little car, but look at it, it's just so happy. Um, the Lotus position, when I first bought the car, this was how you, how you pose in front of a Lotus. And then after I started to work on it, the Lotus position was more like that, uh, but I do love the car. Um, then I happened into Louis. Um, when I lost, after I switched from engineering to writing, I worked at Bentley Publishers. Then I abruptly lost my job at Bentley about four and a half years ago. And um, for some reason, I thought that the appropriate response to that was to buy a TII that hadn't run in a decade, sight unseen in Louisville, road trip down there with all the tools and parts that I thought I might need to sort it out spend a week sleeping <laughs> in the spare room of two people I'd met for 15 minutes at the vintage um, and road trip the car home. Uh, that was in fact what I did. Um, and then I wrote a book about it. Uh, so that's the book, uh, um, Ran When Parked. So this is Louis. Um, I've had probably um, 12 TIIs. Anyone who's had TIIs will tell you that some of them just kind of have it. The fuel injection and the ignition just seem to be a very happily married couple. And on some other ones, you can, you can screw with them forever and not make that car into the other car. I'm not the only one who has had this observation. So Louis, for some reason, is one of those cars and I and again I just love the thing. Um, and then there is Bertha. So Bertha is the 75 2002 that I bought down in Austin, Texas. My wife and I had moved it up to Boston with us. This was my daily driver uh, from like 84 through 86 or 87 in Boston. I actually wanted a big bumpered 2002 to be able to drive and park in Boston. Uh, it was a heavily modified car. I actually turned it into basically a tribute to a TI. Um, it had the struts and the brake. Well, I, I actually happened into a TI, a 2002 TI. So um, the dual side draft Solex version of the TII, the predecessor of the TII. Um, it's the kind of car that now you'd restore, but back then it was just a rusty old 2002. So I used that as a parts car and transferred almost everything into Bertha. So it was a very heavily modified car. It was a car that I, I used to track. I sold it to my friend Alex um, in 1988. Uh, it got stolen several times and then, then parked. Um, and I tried to buy it back several times. Uh, Alex always said no. Finally, in a weak moment, he said yes, but I hadn't seen the car. <laughs> I opened up the garage and I saw this. It had deteriorated enormously, but I, I bought it back and I sorted it out and I wrote another book. So I wrote the book, um, Resurrecting Bertha, about that. So this was the interior, it was a mess. Um, and and Bertha had been landlocked in a garage in back of his neighbor's house. 
And as you can see here on the screen, I think you can see on the screen, there was a driveway, but the driveway now was separated by a fence. And there was no easy way to tow this car out. It, would, it was dead and there was no way to get a tow truck into the backyard. So I wound up spending about a week and a half reviving the car where it sat. So unseizing the wheels and changing the fluids. And it turned out it had a bad valve. So it, it would run, but not at all well. So if I've done this right, this is the video of me actually driving the car up that hill. Those are the ramps just to get it over the curb. So that was the first time this thing had run in 26 years. It was the first time this thing had seen sunlight in 26 years, very satisfying moment. Um, the current project car is Hampton. As I said, this, this, this uh, rather amazing uh, 48,000 mile, one owner, a survivor 2002. I bought this a year and a half ago from its original owner um, on Long Island. Uh, it, it, it's amazing things that, you know, it's got things that work on it, like the buzzer for the door and the ignition actually, actually still work on it. Um, so this car has been accepted um, at, at Bring a Trailer and the auction ought to go up in about a month. Uh, no, owning 12 cars isn't cheap. Uh, it, these are all of the excise, all of the excise tax bills from the city of Newton. They all arrive annually at the same time. Fortunately, most of them are, you know, for about twenty dollars. But having all of them arrive at the same time, it's not like annual inspection, you know, which is uh, not all at the same time. Uh, when this happens, it's it's a little reminder that I have a lot of cars. Um, so my friend, my friend Eric King, who designs my my books, is a very talented graphic artist. Uh, so he had taken uh, this screenshot from the movie you from the movie used cars um, and photoshopped not only my face onto it, but these are actually my <laughs> my cars in the background. Um, so what do I do with all these cars? Well, I work on them. I try to use them. I try to go to events, Mid America O2 Fest, Oktoberfest, Sharkfest, um, Vintage at Saratoga, the vintage. Um, my largest automotive mistake was selling my 82 911 SC right before the big run up in the value of anything air cooled. This is one of the reasons why I'm still holding on to that M Coupe. Uh, I don't drive the M Coupe a lot, but I am. I know that as soon as I sell it, one will go the values. Um, another thing that I write a lot about are uh, what I call the big seven things that are likely to strand you in a vintage car. I guess that thing number zero is a flat tire. I don't talk about that, but those are cooling system issues, fuel delivery, charging system issues, ignition issues, especially on vintage cars with points and condensers. The belts, the ball joints, not so much on BMWs. On vintage BMWs, the ball joints tend to be very hardy. But I have this on the list because of everything in the front suspension, the ball joint is the thing uh, at the bottom of the strut that's the nexus between the suspension 
and the steering. And if you lose a ball joint, you lose control of the car and the front strut will fold under the fender like a twisted ankle. Uh, and the clutch hydraulics. Um, um, I've had clutch hydraulic failure on the last three cars that I've, that I've resurrected. Uh, these are covered in both memoirs of a hack mechanic as well as ran when parked. So where are all of these cars? I used to have a little corrugated metal one car garage. Those of you who have been reading me for years, that was the garage. It was as much of a piece of junk as I wrote about. It was rusting, it was leaning to one side, the paint was flaking. When the workmen came to demolish it, I think they simply insulted it and it fell over. Um, my new garage where I'm standing here, you can see the photo at the bottom, it's attached to the back of the house. It's low, it, ha um, it has a single door that all of the cars have to come in through uh, it does not have individual roll-up doors, so I can easily fit three, which is how you see it, and I can fit a fourth one if I put one on wheel dollies, slide it sideways. Uh, unfortunately, it often looks like this, right? This is not a garage mahal. It's not a trophy garage. This is where I do everything, and so everything winds up everywhere a lot of the time. So I rent space out, out in Fitchburg, which is in central Massachusetts. Um, if you head out, uh, out past the suburbs, uh, it's a lot less expensive to rent space. So I rent these four spaces for, for $75 a month for each space. So 300 a month for four spaces. Uh, it's not hardship for me to drive an hour each way on a Sunday morning and swap cars. It's actually kind of a nice way to use the cars. Um, there's a fallacy about working on newer cars. Uh, the fallacy is that you can't, and it's simply not true. You know, maybe you can't, you can't field repair a bad module or an ECU, but number one, that rarely happens. And number two, normal wear and tear parts like brakes, exhaust, water pumps, cooling systems, you know, shocks, even air conditioning haven't really changed all that much. Now, having said that, I'm well aware that newer BMWs have electric water pumps. And to me, the water's edge is E39, E46 cars. After that, you're into cars with electric water pumps. And I have not yet tried to tackle that. Hack mechanic tips for sane living. Have a clear separation between your daily drivers and your project cars. It's not that you can't work on your daily drivers, but boy, if you're repairing the brakes on a Sunday afternoon and it turns out you have a seized caliper and you need to use that car first thing on Monday morning, that's a problem and problems can be stressful. And you know, if you have another car, uh, that's great, but boy, on project cars, it's just so nice to, you know, if you run into a problem, you just, walk back inside and you order something and when it arrives, you install it. On a big project to keep the momentum going, do one thing a night, no matter how small it is. It could be ordering one part. It could be installing one bolt. It could be reading up on one problem on a forum, but the cumulative effect can be absolutely enormous. One of the things I like to say is that the time is going to pass anyway. If you have a dead car, if you have a project car in the corner of the garage and it's not being worked on, the time is going to pass anyway. Why not have the time pass with some project, with, with some forward momentum on the car? Accept less than perfection. This is a huge one with me. Um, you might think that if you have an, an, an M1 where the only thing that's wrong with it is that it doesn't have the, um, um, the, the chrome end on the tailpipe. Uh, and that if you find that, you will be happy. But I, I can assure you, you won't actually be a more happier person once, once you've dragged a car over the line to where you think it's, it's, 
it's now flawless. Your life actually isn't going to change. Um, don't crave things that you can't have. Um, I don't know, you know, I'm not able to identify any Ferrari, any Italian exotic, you know, that looks like a scalpel. And uh, I'm actually a lot happier that way because I, I can never have one. Um, as I said, I'm not a collector. Collectors typically search out highly valued cars in the best possible condition as those are the ones most likely to appreciate. As I said, I generally commit crimes of opportunity where I'm able to look at the cars. You should buy what you can afford. I don't understand this mentality that people have where they think that cars are immune to the budgetary process that governs everything else that they have to do in their life, right? You, you, can't, you can't buy a house that, that a bank won't qualify you for a mortgage for, right? So, you know, so why crave houses that you can't afford? And yet folks make this mistake with cars all the time. Don't be the person who chases perfection and then waits too long and sees the price spiral out of sight. Why not just be the person who is actually owning and driving the car that you love, even if it's not flawless and smiling while they're driving it instead. Um, I like air conditioning. I do a lot of air conditioning related work. Uh, there's a joke about R70, you know, the, um, the different kinds of refrigerants are that Freon is R12 and its replacement is R134A. So in the vintage car world, there's a joke about R75 slash two, which is 75 miles an hour and the two front windows roll down. I am not an R75 slash two guy. <laughs> I like air conditioning to be working in my vintage cars when I take them on long trips in the summer. Um, or you can do this. <laughs> And incredibly, uh, if, if, if you search online, you can find um, a number of examples uh, of folks who actually <laughs> have retrofit window air conditioning into the side of their cars and are running them off a generator strapped to the, to the trunk. The thing I love about this is the attention to detail. I don't know if you can see on your screen, but it's the caulk around the air conditioner that, that really kind of seals the deal, so to speak. Um, I have a weak spot for 1963 Rambler Ambassadors. One of the reasons why is they have a unique air conditioning system with a knob with three settings. And the settings say cold, colder, and I swear I'm not making this up, desert only. And what the desert only setting is it, it, it's actually something real. It switches off the cycling of the compressor. Um, if you live in a humid environment, if the compressor doesn't cycle on and off, if it doesn't cycle off when it senses the evaporator is starting to freeze up, then the evaporator will start to freeze up. But if you're in a low humidity environment like the desert, you actually can switch off the cycling. So I don't know if you can see this, but that actually does say desert only right on the knob. I want the card just so I can have that. Um, so the books, there now are out seven books. Uh, the ones on the bottom are repair manuals. The ones at the top are the narratives. And uh, the fun announcement is that uh, I'm about to release in late May the best of the hack mechanic, which will be the best of my 35 years of writing for Roundell Magazine. Um, it has been the joy of my life to do so. Uh, I never expected that this would be my life's work, but apparently it is. Uh, the only project I ever have had to bail out of was the hovercraft, which is a whole other story. Um, as my wife, Mary Ann says, behind every hack mechanic is a woman in a dependable car. <laughs> Uh, truer words were rarely spoken. Um, and that's what I, I, I have. Um, uh, thank you to Ian and to Krista and to Tony uh, for having me. You can find me on Facebook. 
you can email me. It is thehackmechanic at AOL.com. The email address so old, it's vintage. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's, that's what I got. And I am happy to um, unshare myself here. Stop share. There we go. I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Rob, could I take you back to your uh, <clears throat> 325IX days? Scott Brown. Yes, hey Scott, how are you? Good, good to see you again. Um, I believe in the past you've vaguely, or you've referred to the steering as vague or uh, some other uh, unflattering adjectives. And I wondered if you'd ever figured that out because I have one now and I've noticed the same thing. Um, I think what I've said is that in general, I don't really like all wheel drive cars. Um, the iX was the first all wheel drive car that I had. And that was quite a while ago. It's probably 25 years ago. Um, so I'm not sure I can comment accurately on the iX. In general, uh, I really prefer rear wheel drive BMWs um, I had a, um, I had a, I had an E46 all wheel drive wagon. Uh, it was a sport package car. Uh, it was nice on paper when there was snow on the ground. I liked it. Um, but there's, uh, it, it, it made the steering just feel kind of sluggish and heavy as compared to a rear wheel drive E46. Um, and so in general, I, try to remain with rear wheel drive BMWs. Yeah, I've just found it, it almost seems like it doesn't want to center up after a corner. And I replaced the top hats on the struts and all that, and that didn't seem to do anything. And I wondered if I was missing something from your experience, but. I, I, I wish I knew more, um, you know, the, the, uh, the thing that would come to mind first is, uh, checking if if the toe is too far out, but I'm sure you've checked that. Yeah, it's, I'll live with it. It's a purpose-built car for a season, and that season's over, so it's going back into the garage for storage. Yeah. So <laughs> I yield the floor. Do we have any other questions for Rob? Yeah, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> Rob. I'm a big fan. Um, and I read your, you know, the hack mechanic book and actually got me back into cars after being off of it for 15 years or so. Um, so I took your advice and I looked for the small bumper cars and, and, you know, certain things you mentioned in that book. And I wound up stumbling upon a 72 Opal GT. Oh, nice. Which, yeah, it was... <laughs> was meant to be a 2002 and somehow wound up being an Opal GT that wound up in my garage. Um, but, but the funny thing is that thing you mentioned about the desert mode, I remember my dad having a K car, you know, it, 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 you know, terrible uh, car, right? It, it, a, lot of, a lot of things behind that. But I do remember reading the owner's manual because anytime my dad got a new car, I was always go through the owner's manual and it did, it did have that in there. It said, you know, only use desert mode only. So they were still using that in the 80s. You oh, know. that's too funny. <laughs> I wasn't aware of that. The um, question I have for you is your, your garage door or what I'm, what I always wonder when I see pictures of your garage is right next to uh, the ha Hampton. Uh, is that the garage door? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> garage oriented. I, I'm like, does he have two garage doors? How does this work? Uh, <laughs> so I said there was only one door, and I kind of lied. Uh, uh, hold on one second. So that's the door behind me through which all the cars have to come in. Okay. The one that you're seeing there is a door, it's actually a double width door. Um, the, the driveway runs along that side of the garage. Right. And runs all the way to the end of the garage. And what, 
what I thought was that initially when the garage was constructed, that I would be able to pull in and do a J hook turn and park one car crosswise in the back. But as it happens, I've never used that door for that. Yeah. I open it. I open it in the summer for light and air. Um, but sure. I've but I've never used it for its intended purpose. I see. I see. Okay, because I <laughs> you've mentioned how your garage is laid out with your little nook there under the porch to hide a, hide another car or something like that. And I was always trying to figure out where that, you know, how it's all uh, configured in there. <laughs> so, um, saw... so actually, let me ask you a question. How do you like the Opal? Uh, well, I am very close to finally getting it on the road. So I, I can't really tell you. I, I bought it right around the same time you bought that Lotus behind you and uh, went through a little bit more of an intensive restoration than I thought I was going to go through when I first bought it as these things go and uh, but but I'm about a few weeks away from finally getting it on the road and, and getting it out there so the fun Wait, thing about it is Adrian you, you have to tell him the 2002 connection yes yeah so the fun thing about it is since I was originally looking for a 2002 when I stumbled upon this little uh, German car um, I wound up put, and it needed a motor anyway, because sure, why not? Let's add that to the list. And I wound up putting a uh, M10 in it from a 2002 with a uh, 84 fuel injection setup in it. Oh, cool. Yeah. So in the end of the day, it's got a BMW heart with a uh, quasi German, US, <laughs> French mixed uh, uh, origins of an Opal GT. Very cool. <laughs> so uh, it should be a fun car. When I, when I finally get it on the road, I'm hoping to bring it to Carlisle in, in May. I was unaware that you were able to do that swap. I had read that the, that, that the frame rails are very close together. The engine compartment's very small. Yeah, yeah all of it's true. Uh, there's nothing, there's no easy swap in an Opal GT. It's an amazingly small engine compartment and it did require some slight modifications. Um, nothing too, uh, too crazy, but yes, it, <laughs> it custom engine mounts. It, 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 it definitely went, went a little bit more beyond a, you know, standard, uh, I'd say domestic, you know, buy your engine mount kit online. And uh, plug and play, you know, this is <laughs> one of the things I went through with the Lotus when I uh, when when it it needed a motor, uh, the choice was, you know, to rebuild the existing one to find another one or to do some sort of a swamp. Um, and uh, I wasn't able to find another one. There just aren't any other ones. And it turns out that rebuilding it was problematic, which is a whole long story. So I looked at swaps and folks swap a number of engines. Um, the problem is uh, it's not like swapping a Subaru motor into a Vanagon, right? That's something that there's a whole sub-industry right. for, right? You can buy the wiring harness, you can buy the mounts, you can, you can buy the plumbing, you can buy everything, you can buy it a la carte. It turns out that for the Europa, there's like, there's like nine people who have done the swap and each of them has their own website about how they had cobbled it up. Yeah. So um, you save in terms of a motor, right? You can, you can swap in something like a ZTEC, right? And you can find a ZTEC motor for like 300 bucks in a junkyard, but you pay for it everywhere else. Yes. So I wound up deciding that if my engine could be rebuilt, that it should be rebuilt. And that turned out to be, I think, the right thing to do, though it took like six years. But. <laughs> yeah, well, you probably went down the right path because the, the swap, a uh, customized swap is certainly a whole nother path to go down and uh, yeah, as far as Opal GTs, anybody who is swapping engines, first of all, mentions the LS word 
as the first thing, you know, anytime you do an engine swap, it has to have LS. In LS it, yeah. Yeah. So I said, no, I don't want to go down that path. And then, like I said, my, my first, uh, you know, was trying to get a 2002. So I figured, well, why not? Why don't I just marry the two together? And then I wound up getting a 2002 anyway, which was a, a ton of fun too. That's awesome. Yeah. It's, it's, it's been great reading your articles and, uh, and the inspiration. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, I have a question for you, but before I ask the question, I have kind of a follow-up to Scott's question. I think it was on the self-centering. I think it's less likely the toe and more likely the caster. So you may want to look at caster because I think that has a lot to do with how it's going to self-center. Um, the question I have, um, also a big fan, you know, always read the articles in Roundell, read most of your books. You, you. you talk about your sort of opportunity of crime, you know, the you know, crime of getting that car for the, the bargain. But what's what's sort of the ultimate determining factor in how far you're willing to go on a car that I mean, you've shown us great examples of, you know, going farther than most of us would feel comfortable with to get a car. But, you know, there's sort of this common wisdom of buy the best car you can afford. but Clearly, you're buying some of these based on emotion more than it being the best example of what you could afford at that time. I, I think, I think. So maybe you could elaborate a little bit more on that. Um, sure. Um, so the, you know, the advice to buy the best car that you can afford is great advice. Uh, I don't mean to say that it is not. Um, the uh, you know there's a saying that there's no th there there there's no money cheaper than uh, than what the previous owner has already spent right um, you know it it always will be more cost effective to buy a car that has had um, work done on it than to pay to have that work done yourself, especially with body work um, and paint. Um, um, you know, unless you, unless you do it yourself, which I don't, you know, unless you own a body shop or have a relative who owns a body shop who's charging you um, a discounted rate, um, it, it, it always is to your advantage to buy a car uh, that already has had restoration work done as opposed to buying something and saying that you are going to restore it. I don't restore anything. Uh, the, sole, the sole exception was that Red E9. Uh, and that was because I was young. I didn't know any better. I wanted an E9 so bad I could cry. Um, and they weren't worth then what they're worth now. And the cost of paint and body work then wasn't what it is now. Um, as I said, I think I, think I spent $1,200 on the, on the body panels. This was all in 86. I think I paid someone $700 to weld them on. And then uh, the stripping to bare metal and uh, the leveling, the panels, and the um, uh, the paint, which was um, set um, seven coats of color and seven coats of clear, all wet sanded. That was a four thousand dollar paint job. That was a lot of money back in uh, back in um, 1988. Uh, I literally took out a bank loan for that. Um, my mother thought I was nuts. Um, it, it, it's, it's the sole exception to my saying that I don't restore anything. And it's the only car that I've ever owned that I have gone through that whole sort of a process with. Um, in, in, in my first book, I talk at length about restoration. I think the chapter is literally called Restoration and Why It Makes No Freaking Sense. Um, you know, so why do people do it? Well, they do it because they want to, you know, it's like, it's like building a house, 
right? If you want to, you know, if you want something that's custom, then you enter the process. And what pops out at the end is something that reflects all of those choices. So if you restore mm -hmm. something, you come out with something that's exactly what you want, right? It's the engine that you want, the suspension that you want, the interior that you want, the paint that you want, on and on and on. Whereas if you, if you buy something that, that already has had all that done, you're buying someone else's choices. Um, if the car is basically stock, then you know what those choices are. Uh, if it's modified, you know, maybe you like those choices and maybe you don't, which is why looking at modified cars can be iffy. I'm sort of starting to wander off the question, but I, you know, I, um, a lot of what I do, I will freely admit, <laughs> I, you know, I, I had someone walk up to me once at the vintage and, and say, uh, I finally figured you out. You buy these, uh, these ridiculous hanging project cars. So you'll have something to write about. <laughs> and then he laughed. And I said, what you, you, you think that's a secret? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, yeah. It in fact is almost close to a business model. I mean, I am at this point in my life, a full-time self-employed writer. If I bought cars that, that didn't need anything, you know, I'd have nothing to write about. So yes, I do seek out, I do seek out projects that sometimes uh, might e even border on the ridiculous. Um, I'm a buying bag. I'm buying back, buying back Bertha. You know, it was the car that my wife and I drove off from our wedding in. You know, there's only one of those, right? There's only one car that my wife and I drove off from our wedding in. So it, it did have some emotional appeal. It was a 2002 that I had set up as a track car. So it has a hot engine with a hot cam and high compression pistons and Weber's and a coning suspension and a five speed and air conditioning and on and on and on. Um, but it, it needed everything. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I like the process of um, reviving dead cars. Um, yeah, there's a satisfaction in it all, you know, yeah. seeing, seeing that, figuring out the issues. Clearly you've, you've, you know, your genre is heavily in cars that tend to have rust. And you said you don't really do body work, but you've clearly figured out how to work on pretty much everything else in the car. Has there been a specific reason why you didn't get into the body work? Is it just too specialized or just time consuming? Actually, there's a, a welder sitting right here. Where is it? Uh, yeah. There you yeah. go. There's a Millermatic welder that I bought and have not learned how to use yet. I had the best intentions. Um, I, you know, I, um, in Massachusetts, uh, if a car has an externally visible rust hole, it won't pass inspection. Um, there is a, uh, there is a, um, well, well-priced appealing looking um, E30, 325 ES, about an hour north of me for 2,900 bucks. Um, it's a project car. It looks like a project car, you know, but it's got intact sports seats. It's a five speed. And the guy says that it runs and drives, but it needs a brake line and all sorts of other stuff. Um, but it's got holes in the rocker panels. Um, Th that's not an inspectable car here in Massachusetts. Uh, or if it is, it's by accident. Um, so, you know, that, you know, that has changed things for me. Um, the cars that I have, if they have rust, you know, it's maybe holes in the floorboards, which generally they don't check. But if they do, then I have a problem. Right. So, yeah, so I try to find things that are, you know, that have a solid enough body. I don't really care what the paint is. I don't really care, you know, if there's, if there's rust on the surface. 
um, but that are just in need of mechanical work. And it is harder than it used to be. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Sure. Anyone else? Hey, Rob. Um, I'm Bart. Hey. Love your, love your work. Thanks for that. Keep it a smile. Um, I was asking you, you, you mentioned the vintage, and I was interested to hear a little more. Um, I've never been. I understand what it's May 20th this year. So I got two questions. I'm a track guy mostly. So um, I've given up a weekend if I go to the vintage, it's instead of a weekend at, uh, at the track. And then second, my wife supports me in my car habit, but you know, I said, would you like to go to this? And she said, what would I talk about? Um, so can I, you know, do you recommend bringing your spouse who doesn't, who's not into it? And do you recommend that over the track? It, it's hard for me to answer either of those questions for what's right for you. Um, um, the vintage is a wonderful event. It's, it's not a judged event. It's not a concour. It's sort of like a big old uh, um, cars and coffee. You know, it's out in a field. Um, the, uh, the event itself is on Saturday. Um, there are, um, associated events the day before and the day after, um, the show at the BMW CCA foundation of, uh, of the pre-war cars is about to close. So this is sort of everyone's last chance to catch that show. So a lot of us will be heading down to, to the foundation on Friday, um, the event hotel, um, which is the Clarion at the airport um, and the nearby hotels. Um, a lot of the fun of the vintage is just walking around in the parking lot at the hotel. Okay. Um, um, it's, it's a great bunch of people. I started to go in 2010, you know, I now, you know, it's, it's almost cliche, you know, to talk about people as your vintage car family, you know, when it's folks that you see once a year, but it's true. And, you know, in this world of social media, you, you're interacting with them a lot more than once a year, you know, cause I'm interacting with them online all the time. Um, it's the kind of event where if you have, um, trouble with your car, you know, um, four different people will be falling all over each other to, you know, help you to solve the problem. Um, it, it's a very, um, it's a very low maintenance, low load um, event. Um, a lot of folks are there with their spouses. Uh, I do not come with mine because her idea of hell is 17 hours in a vintage car. Um, <laughs> she will come to vintage at Saratoga with me. You know, that's like a four hour straight shot from Boston, you know, out, out to Saratoga Springs. Um, that works great, right? We can, we can shoot out after work on a Friday and stay Friday night and go to the event on Saturday and stay Saturday night. And then on Sunday, we can head home the long way and stop, you know, at every antique store and craft store. And I don't mean that in any sort of a pejorative way whatsoever. You know, um, you know my thing is kind of long distance driving. And an event like the Vintage, which when it was in Winston-Salem, that was about 750 miles from Boston. So I could wake up at four, hit the road at 5 a.m., and, you know, if nothing went wrong, I would be there at seven at night, right, right before dark. So it would slot in perfectly. Once they moved it to Asheville, it added 150 miles, right? I don't have another three hours left of consciousness in me at the end of the day. So now it's no longer a one-day drive down. It's a two-day drive down. Okay. Um, it's, it, I've, I've done it in a day. I've headed home in a day. By the time I get home, I feel like someone has thrown sand in my eyes. Um, 
So the, the vintage event is really Saturday afternoon seems to be the prime time to be there. Well, Saturday afternoon is the event itself, okay. right? The event hotel is um, in Winston-Salem. The event is actually in Hot Springs, which is about 50 miles to the north of that. I'm sorry, the event hotel is in Asheville, Asheville, Asheville. It's moved to Asheville. Um, but the event itself, the Saturday event is about 50 miles north of Asheville in Hot Springs. You know, and it's out in a field in, in this little town of Hot Springs. So all the cars are out there. There are trees, so there is some shade. It can get kind of hot. 500 um, cars? 500 cars? 500 cars. It's um, Maybe it's up to 600 now. It was 500. Uh, then they increased it to 600. Um, the, the cutoff is, I believe, 1990. Uh, no car is newer than 1990. So everything up through E30s, uh, E34s. Uh, I'm looking at taking the. I'm looking at taking the 88 E30. Yep. Um, I have a 2002, but not not to drive 10 hours. <laughs> Art, I would highly recommend the Saratoga too. And Saratoga is great. Yeah. And, and Rob, well, Isabella, our daughter, has a 2002, and it limped there. <laughs> and Rob really helped her out. Um, but it ended up going home in a covered trailer because it couldn't be helped. <laughs> it couldn't be helped. <laughs> but we made it there. Right. But again, the, Sar the Saratoga brings a lot of cars. And I guess for spouses that aren't as into the car stuff. The village there is beautiful. There's Absolutely. Restaurants, um, smaller scale, easier to get to, as long as Dave Matthews isn't playing that weekend. Hotels are pretty easy to get to. Um, and the club usually tries to put something together non-COVID, so. Hey, Bart, right. I'll, go, I'll go to Saratoga with you. <sighs> And right. again, you'll I don't know. I was playing Isabella's 2002 out there two years ago, and that thing seemed to be going pretty good. So you yeah, that was that okay. Problem. It was the year before that that it okay. wasn't. So bad. I was gonna say you must have fixed that problem because it was moving pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for Joe no, put a starter or some other kind of stuff in, and I don't know. For no, <laughs> uh, no Joe Ajavon. It was Joe Ajavon. They got Isabella hooked on 2002. So when Isabella was 15 years old. All she wanted was a 2002 because of her uncle Joe Angevin. Nice. So I found a 2002 in Philadelphia. I went down to Philly. I brought it back. It was a completely rush-free car, and we gave it to her for her 16th birthday. It's awesome. As a surprise. As a surprise. With the Angevins. The Angevins. So when we drove it to the vintage, uh, Isabella and I were in the 2002. Crystal was following in a think a, one of our E24s. Anyhow, the car limped to the vintage. We got it right to the museum and it literally stopped and it wouldn't start again. It wouldn't start. Next morning, Rob and some other people were trying to help her out to get the car running. Well, it didn't run. So what do we do? We called Joe Ajavon, who's back in Rochester. So he came out with an enclosed trailer and a couple of buddies and they picked up the car and brought it back to Rochester. So, but now ever since that, the car has been mint. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a great show. Well, hey, thanks, good. Rob. Thanks, thanks for that input about the uh, uh, vintage. I, I, I'm going to check. And thanks also for the input about Saratoga. So I'll check. I'm in Central PA, so uh, both of those are um, possible. Good stuff. Thank you. Well, very good. I think we've got our money's worth on Rob tonight. Did you have something, Krista? You're, you're muted. We can't hear you. Uh, there we go. You'll get a variety of people at the Saratoga. They're from all over the place. So it's an interesting group of people, really, that come there. Yeah. I'll have to find that date on the on the web. So thanks. And we'll send, we'll send info out soon. <laughs> right, Krista? <laughs> all right. So I think I think we've I think we should let Rob uh, have a have a beverage and recover his voice. 
Thank you so much. And uh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and thank you all for your participation. So good night, everyone. I'll stop recording. Yeah.